Now, most of you guys are familiar with my kids, Lincoln, seven years old back there, and Zara, four years old, and one more who's due to arrive pretty much any time in the next two or three weeks. Well, Zara is four years old, this little princess of mine, and we were so excited when church recently started offering um, Sunday school again for her age group, and so many of you guys help out every week in chips. How many of you guys serve in chips on, uh, let me see the hands, Most, a lot of our students serve in chips, that's pretty awesome. So we were so excited, and we're trying to slowly introduce the idea of leaving mom again and going to Sunday school so we can enjoy church, that second service. And it took some time to really try to encourage her, and I was trying to pump her up, you know, get her excited so she would stay in class. And as I was talking to her, her first response to me about going to Sunday school, she said, I'm a little bit scared. (laughs) So I was like, oh, okay. So I want to ask her, I had to ask, why was she a little bit scared about going to Sunday school? And my four-year-old, who hasn't even been to Sunday school in over a year, said, Dad, what if I don't have any friends in my class? And I was like, oh, who makes sure you got friends of people like? I was like, but as a four-year-old, it's unbelievable that at such an early age for her that there was an awareness and a desire to have friends and to be accepted and connected to those friends. Now, whether you realize it or not now, one of the greatest human needs that you will have is that for meaningful friendships. And that is not by accident. That was put in you as a design by God. Aside from romantic relationships in Genesis 2.18, God said it's not good for man to be alone. And he began to introduce others into this world. And that is what is all about. If you haven't noticed, there's a lot of people in this world. And if you've forgotten that, Go back in that traffic and you'll drive through Atlanta and you will notice there is a lot of people in this city and a lot of people in this world. And there's a lot of people connected to the church, the body of Christ. So as a student, as you grow up and as you assimilate into college age groups and our hyphen groups and the rest of the church, it is so important as a follower of Jesus Christ to learn to have healthy friendships and relationships as we all work together and interact in the kingdom of God. That is incredibly important in the life of a believer. So we're going to take a little bit time to talk about this simple subject, not so simple, and that is friends. Everybody say friends. It's real deep. The definition of a friend is this. It's one who is attached to another by feelings or affection of personal regard. That's a little bit formal. But a friend is somebody who's not hostile to you. It's a favored companion, a person who gives assistance, a patron, a supporter. To break it down a little bit more, more definition, is a person who is on good terms with another person, somebody that's not hostile, a person who you know well, and a person who you like a lot. A friend is somebody that you trust and you like enough to hang out with on a regular basis. And finally, this is strange to me, but one of the newest definitions of a friend is a person associated with another as a contact on a social media website. The digital world is changing the way we view friendship. During our COVID season, we learned the importance that and the value of still interacting, even though it may be over uh, a digital platform. We had a young lady connect with our Zoom calls who's just recently moved to Atlanta and she had forged friendships and her first Sunday here I saw some of the young ladies run over and say hey and meet like you were best friends but it's the first time that you've seen each other face to face and that's the power and digital world how it's changing the way we view friendship. 
is so important. But regardless of what you define as a friend, regardless of who you call friend or who calls you friend, it is so important to understand how to handle yourself as a Christian within friendships. Now there's a, there's a book, a very basic book, that uh, talks about what every kid should know about dealing with friendship. So this is like the breakdown, breakdown version. And it lists this few simple do's and don'ts about being a friend. So I want you to catch these. The do's of being a friend are simply these. If you want to be a good friend, do listen. Do show interest in the other person and not always being about yourself. Do be loyal. Do be open, do be considerate, do understand. And guys, I know this is not in your comfort zone. Do share your feelings. <laughs> I heard like, oh. <laughs> especially about your friendship. Like, not happening. Do give friends the benefit of the doubt. Do talk over misunderstandings and do apologize. Those are some do's of friendships. Then there's a quick list of the don'ts of being a friend. And this is pretty deep too. It says don't talk behind your friend's back. Everybody say amen. Don't reveal secrets. Everybody say amen, amen. Don't criticize. Don't correct. Don't be a pest. Don't borrow without returning. Don't be moody all the time. Don't brag all the time. Don't be demanding. And don't expect perfection. The do's and the don'ts of friendship. So that's a pretty awesome list. I could just turn off the iPad and we could be dismissed and wrap it up for the night. I could end my lesson right there. But you guys aren't getting off that easy tonight. But as Christians, we should add another layer to our understanding and our approach to friendships. We understand that everything that we do, including forging friendships, should be guided by the principles in the Word of God. Outside of your family, the most powerful influence in your life will be your friends. So simply put, friendships can make or break your relationship with God. That is why it's so important that we understand the context of healthy friendships and relationships, how to approach them, how to interact and react to them in our life. So I want to talk a little bit more uh, about this in detail later, but you need to have godly relationships that strengthen you, that make you better. Iron sharpens iron, right? And there also needs to be a season of your life when you build relationships and where you are the one being a blessing, when you are the one, the stronger of the two, where you're the one making somebody else better. You need that kind of friendship. One, you need friendships where you have somebody who challenges you and makes you a better person. And then you also need some friendships where you're doing that for somebody else, where you're mentoring, strengthening, and helping someone as well. When it comes to your friendships and relationships in the church, the Bible actually says that we should view the friendships within the church as more than just being friends. Ephesians 2.19 says, So now you Gentiles, you're no longer strangers, you're no longer foreigners, you are citizens, along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Turn to somebody next to you, tell them, say, hey, fam. That's right. All through the scriptures, those who were in a covenant and saving relationship with Jesus Christ were referenced as family. So understand that here in the church, we are one body, right? Dwelling in the household of God, in the kingdom of God, as we just talked about and sang about. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are God's spiritual sons and daughters. And it is God's plan, it is God's design for the church to be a family of friends, a community of believers working together to advance his purpose on the earth. So what does that look like? 
Now, another aspect of friendship that we have to be aware of is fulfilling God's purpose for the church, to be a light in the darkness. And we're going to get into that as well. I'm doing, kind of doing high level tonight, okay, to set this up for the next few weeks. But yes, we're called, right, to come out from the world, to be separate from the influence of the lifestyle and the beliefs of this world, to come out from among them, be separate. But we also have to make friendships and connections within the world to attempt to reach the loss with the gospel of Jesus Christ. As we say in our church here at Atlanta West, we must meet people on common ground, build friendships and relationships, so we can try to take them and lead them to holy ground. But that is why it's a very careful balance, especially in the life of a teenager, of who is influencing who, and who is being led closer to God or farther from God in that relationship. And that is why we have to stay so full of the power of the Holy Ghost, to be spirit-led, to have a clear understanding, as we're going to establish here tonight in the next few weeks, an understanding of the guiding principles of God's Word to bring balance and guidance in your friendships within the church and without. So I want to fair, uh, share a few general thoughts about friendships before we get in those detailed principles. First, I want you guys to understand that you don't always get to choose your friends. That's the first thing. You don't always get to choose your friends. You can't exactly pick them out and say, you know what, I would want that person or that person to be my close friend, and then that's settled in your pals for life. Now, in a future lesson this month, I'm going to take some time to explain how to make friends. Simply put, you can approach people, a certain group of friends, a certain group, with the right attitude. You can do those do's of friendship. You can show yourself friendly, as the Bible says. You're not, you know, not trying to force a friendship, not trying too hard to impress others. And you can see what happens. You can see where it goes. But the first point is you don't always get to choose your friends. And some people have a hard time understanding, well, I really want to be that person's friend. And they don't want to be my friend. And they get all bent out of shape and worried about that. But you don't always get to choose your friends. Sorry to bust that bubble in your life. The second point can be hard for a teenager to understand as well, but understand that not everyone in this room is going to be close friends. Now, depending on compatibility and personality, common interests, someone may or may not become a close friend to you. We have a large church. There's a lot of young couples, young married couples. And my wife and I would just naturally have gravitated and become closer to some friends than we are to other people. That doesn't mean we don't love them. That doesn't mean that we're not a part of the body of Christ and we show them respect and kindness. But we're just closer to other people. That's just how it goes sometimes. And when you're trying to be around a certain friend, then and that doesn't it work out, sometimes that can be hard. You feel a little bit of embarrassment or rejection, but that's something that you need to learn to work through. Just because someone doesn't want to be a close friend to you, it doesn't mean that that's an awful person, okay? And this is not super spiritual, but this is real practical, especially within a youth group. There are a lot of followers of Jesus, right? A lot of them. A lot of people that want to be close to him, crowded in next to him, but guess what? When it came time for him to choose who he would closely connect to, he chose just 12, right? Crowds of people. Everybody wanted to be near Jesus, close to Jesus. They had to run away from people who wanted to be close to him. But he only chose 12, chose 12, not 13, not 26, not 52. So the second point that you need to understand is not everyone is going to be your close friend. And the third thing that you need to know about friendship is that while you may have a close friend at some point in your life, you may not always stay close friends to them, and that's okay. But sometimes as a student, that's hard to understand when your bestie from middle school or elementary school is not very close to you now in high school, right? This is real, right? This, is, this happens. You understand this. There's some people that you hang out with and something happens within that group or a breakup or something happens and it kind of splinters or makes things uncomfortable and awkward and your group and your friends, it morphs and they change. 
Now, there's a many different seasons of life. You transition from a young child to your teenage years to being a hyphen, a young adult, to being an adult, a young married, and the seasons of life that goes on and on and on. And not only do these seasons of life change, but many times you change and other change, others change too in those seasons. Your location can change, your interests, your passions can change, your values, your life focus and direction, it can all change. And because of that, there can be some effects within friendships and relationships. Now somebody else, a friend of yours, may even get introduced to somebody else along the way that they become closer to than you. Everybody say, ouch. There may be instances when you were a friend uh, make poor life decision, and that becomes a, a wedge in your friendships. But you need to arm yourself with this information that during the seasons of life, students, understand this, some friendships will grow closer, and some friendships will grow apart. And you need to protect yourself from being upset or being offended or having a bad spirit. It's not always an evil thing. Sometimes it's just life, and sometimes it can even be a part of God's plan. There's a man in the Bible named Onesimus, 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 O-N-E-S-I-U-M-U-S. Figure that one out, Onesimus. He was a slave, okay, of Philemon, who had stolen from him, okay? He had this, in that culture, there were slaves, and he had a slave, Philemon, and Philemon stole from his master, and then he ran away from him, and he fled. But in running away, Onesimus met Paul, and Paul and him became connected as friends. And, uh, uh, excuse me, Onesimus, Onesimus, we're just calling him Sim, all right? Everybody say Sim. For some reason, I can't get that one tonight. Sim met Paul, and they became friends and a Christian. A friend of Philemon, Paul was wrote to him on behalf of this new friend to restore what had been broken. And Paul said, okay, hey, I know this guy used to be a slave. He worked for you. He's part of this. He was connected to you. But now he's come away, and we've become friends. And this relationship, this working relationship that you had, it's been broken and violated but now I've interacted with him, and he's changed. He's different. And it says this in the Bible. It says, if he has done you any wrong, or if he owes you anything, charge it to me. Then after the friendship was formed, Paul let Sims go and sends him back to Philemon, which is pretty incredible. He became friends with him. He became close to him. He helped him grow. Iron sharpens iron. He strengthened him. And then that season of friendship was over, and he sent him back to Philemon. But so often we can clutch and hold on to a friendship that was only meant for a season. And in turn, we can choke what God intended to be free. So instead of looking for what our friends can do for us, let us look at what God's purpose is for placing them in our proximity and have an understanding if you grow apart that that could just be a part of God's plan, that that friendship that you had was just for a season. Now, I have to, I have to use this youth pastor disclaimer, okay, because some of you guys can take what I've said as license or permission to ice people out and not be friendly, okay, but that's not what I'm getting to tonight. Just because you may not be a close friend with someone right now, or if your friendship drifts apart, that does not mean that you have permission to be unfriendly, right? You do not have permission to ignore other people, right? You do not have permission to be rude, to isolate or treat anyone unkindly or with disrespect. As Christians, we're commanded to love one another and to forgive one another. And if you have a group of friends and you are intentionally leaving somebody out, that's not okay. You may have some close friends that you hang out with more than others, but that shouldn't always be a closed group. I believe that as Christians, we should have a responsibility to be compassionate for others, to be aware of those who may be left out and to include those who are lonely, who need the support of some healthy friendships. And if you believe that, say amen. amen. So finally, I want to remind you of how powerful your friends and your relationships can be. 1 Corinthians 1533 tells us that bad company, bad friendships that corrupts your good 
character. Proverbs 13, 20 tells us that as, as students of God, followers of Jesus Christ, we are commanded to walk, to become friends with the wise and become wise. But if we get into friendships and relationships with people who are foolish, who make unwise decisions, we will become fools and we will become in trouble. So remember that those closest to you will affect your attitude. They will affect your spirit. They will affect your character. So be wise and be cautious when it comes to your friends. As I continue talking about friends for the next few weeks, I want you guys starting tonight to pray that you would have an awareness of the friendships in your life. I want you guys to take some mental notes of those that you are connected to here within the church and those that you're connected to outside of the church. I want that to be in your mind as we go through, as I begin to share these principles in the next few weeks, as I begin talking about some different areas, that those friendships are right there in the front of your mind. So when the word of God comes, as Brother Zach mentioned earlier, that word of God comes and I can hold it up and apply it to my friendships. Principles about friendships and how to act, how they affect our lives. We take that principle and then we bring it over here within that friendship that's in the front of our mind and we begin to apply it and we let it shape our decisions and actions within those friendships. I challenge you to take some time to observe your actions, your thoughts, your words when you're around certain friends. Ask the Lord to help you to see how those people are influencing you, how you are influencing them. Each week, you need to be asking God, do my friendships measure up to those guiding principles of your word? Make some decisions, and if needed, make some adjustments to ensure that your friendships are in line with the word of God, because there is nothing more important than your relationship with God. Amen? All through the Bible, we see incredible examples of friendship. And one example is a friendship between a woman named Naomi and her daughter-in-law, Ruth. It started off as a family relationship. Naomi had a son, and Ruth married her son. She had two sons and two daughters-in-law. Now, Naomi went through some really difficult seasons of her life, and she desperately needed somebody to be a friend, to be close to her. First, her husband died, and in the next few years, both of her sons died too. This woman was going through an incredibly difficult season of her life. She was desperate and done, so she decided that she was going to move away, get a fresh start in her life. And she told both of her daughters-in-law, she said, you know what? We were connected before because of a family relationship, but that is now done. My sons have died. You're no longer married, so why don't you go back home? She said, I want you to go back to your families, and I want you to try to start over a fresh life. Maybe you can get married again. Maybe God will bless you with children, and you can start a new life. It was a very difficult conversation. The Bible talks about how they were very distraught in this conversation, and they were torn, both of the daughters-in-law, and they were crying back and forth. It was a difficult decision. But because of their relationship that had turned into a friendship, first Orpah decided that she would go home, one daughter-in-law. But then Ruth, the Bible says, because that relationship had gone just from a family connection and obligation, that she had a true friendship and a connection with Naomi. And the, Naomi. And the Bible says that Ruth clung to her. She could have thought of herself. Ruth could have thought of her future in that moment, but she put the needs of a friend now, of Naomi, above hers, and she stuck with her through the most difficult season of her life. When she could have had a fresh start, she thought about her friend, and she moved and traveled with her, and the Lord blessed them both. In Samuel, we read about two friends, Jonathan and David. As a young person, David met King Saul, went before King Saul, and afterwards he met Jonathan. And the Bible says there was an immediate moment, a bond between them where they were both like, did we just become best friends? Like, it was immediate. That's what the Bible says, an immediate bond between the two of them. But their relationship, it got a little bit complicated, mainly because Jonathan's dad, King Saul, kept trying to kill David. 
That's a slight issue to navigate within a friendship of yours, right? Like, hey, man, you want to come over and hang out, play video games? Like, yeah, let's do it. Like, wait, is your dad going to be there today? Like, I don't know why. Well, you know, last time we were hanging out in the living room, he tried to spear me and pin me against the wall. I really don't feel like dying today. Oh, yeah. Maybe come over next week. You imagine that? Those are their best friends bonded together, and every time they try to hang out, the other guy's dad is trying to murder him. Like, that's a complicated relationship, right? But the Bible says that David, he actually escaped Saul twice, so it happened more than once. And uh, David and Jonathan had the difficult relationship and friendship, to say the least, but they had this unbelievable bond and loyalty to one another. Eventually, though, they had to part ways, as I mentioned before, as some friendships end up doing. And when they did, this is what was said, 1 Samuel 20, 42. At last, Jonathan said to David, go in peace. We have sworn loyalty to each other in the Lord's name. The Lord is the witness of a bond between us and a bond between our children forever. Then David left and Jonathan returned to the town. Then, the most incredible display of this long-lasting friendship came years later. And David's dear friend Jonathan was tragically killed in battle along with his father, King Saul. And the, the Bible says you saw the depth of that relationship because David and his men, they literally tore their clothes in grief and sorrow when they heard the news. David, he mourned, he wept, he fasted, he couldn't even eat because of the news of his friend passing away. But once that friendship had ended by death, it wasn't, the, the friendship didn't end there. In honor of their loyal friendship and the bond between them, we see that it continued years later that Jonathan died, but David took in Jonathan's son, a handicapped child, and David made that child a son of his own and was there at his table and took care of him for all of his days. From these two stories, guys, as I've read them about Naomi and Ruth and Jonathan and David, does that level of love and loyalty and commitment and friendship, does that even compute nowadays? You, you view your friendships and the way that you approach friendships and those in the church and the family of God, is there even close comparison between the two? And does that not bring an awareness to how far our understanding of friendship and the family of God has really gone? So tonight, I want to encourage you, as we in this first lesson, to simply pray and ask God. Say, God, I want to, there's a lot of areas in our life, and this is what we do in the crowd. We're helping become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. We just focused on stewardship, and now we're talking about friendship. And God, in this separate area of my life, I need strength. I need your insight. I need your help. Because God, I want to be my very best for you in all areas. I want wholeness in me, God. I want to be a healthy Christian. And when it comes to friendships, God, I pray that you would help me, give me wisdom, and Give me guidance, Lord, for the friendships of my past, Lord, that may not be as strong as they once were. Give me wisdom and guidance, God, on how to still approach and respect and love those who I may have been uh, disconnected from. Lord, help me right now with these current relationships that I in, um, that I'm in right now, those people that I interact with. And Lord, help me to see and understand. Are they helping me be closer to you, Jesus, or are they pushing me farther away? God, am I being the influencer and and am I helping them or are they bringing me down? And then ask God for those relationships in the future that he would help you in your life.